Thank you so much for, um, for coming to the New America Foundation after work. I assume for many of you it's after work. We're just thrilled we're going to have a great conversation. I'm Liza Mundy. I'm the program director of the breadwinning and caregiving program here at New America. Um, I'd like to introduce Bridget Schulte, who is um, author of Overwhelmed, which is just a wonderful book. And, uh, and it, it's just, well, I'll, I'll talk about how wonderful it is and why. Um, and I would also like to interview two uh, people who are experts in this uh, terrain and who are also in the book and still talking to Bridget because she did a great job of, of representing them and their work, I think, unless they have anything planned to say. Um, so we have Melvin White, who is the lead counsel uh, for litigation and risk management at Clearspire, which is a law firm here in DC. And we have Dr. Kathleen Hicks, who is the senior vice president and Henry A. Kissinger chair and director for international security, the international security program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She is also the former Principal Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy at the US Department of Defense. So um, we will have a look forward to a great conversation. And, uh, and then we will open it up for questions. And um, it's, uh, so it will be fun. And I just wanted to, this is a little bit self-indulgent, but um, Bridget and I, in fact, to go way back, we go back further, I think, than either of us would like to admit. We um, both started our careers uh, in journalism at State's News Service, which was an overwhelming job, if there ever was one. Um, one might call it a journalistic sweatshop. If, um, and it, 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 it was an overwhelming place to work, and we got paid little and sometimes nothing and sometimes on the nothing. weeks when the paychecks bounced. <laughs> so, um, so that was, um, but it was a great bonding experience, and um, and and I treasure my friendships, particularly with Bridget, and mm. uh, and we've been colleagues at the Washington Post, and um, Bridget is still at the Washington Post, and as well here at New America. Um, so I just wanted to start with um, one brief an uh, anecdote. I, I think one of the things for Bridget when you write a book like this is you're inundated by people who rush up to you and say, oh, this is my life. This is just my life. Let me tell you this anecdote from my life. So um, when I started at the Washington Post about, um, about uh, low these many years ago, um, <laughs> I, I was hired at the magazine as an editor by, um, by someone who said, well, we don't think that you're ready for this job, but we need a woman on the masthead. And so that was, those were the auspicious beginnings. And, um, and a couple years into editing, I wanted to switch to writing, and I started writing a column at about the same time that I had my first child and was getting used to what it was like to be a working parent. Um, and, and as Bridget can attest, the newsrooms, uh, like many workplaces, are, were never set up for people with families. It was, a, it was a culture where you got to work late, you worked late. Uh, you know, phone calls were returned at about five, and then you wrote your piece and you sent it to your editor. And, and even at the magazine where I was hired, and there was no reason for this, we were on that same daily schedule as well. So even though, in theoretically, it was a weekly magazine, we could have gone home at five, we could have gone home at four thirty, whatever, but we didn't. So um, I, I remember not putting my child in childcare because I didn't think I could get to the daycare center by six when it would close. And looking back at me, that was just crazy. Uh, and I didn't feel like I could push back against it either. So I. Um, I was writing a column, and one of the first columns that I wrote was about being a working parent, because it was such a new experience. And I wrote about the experience of getting into the workplace and, um, and, and reaching into my work bag and all these bizarre things that were now in my work bag, like you know the car keys that I had had to replace because my old car keys, I was visiting my mom and putting my daughter in her car seat, and I put my car keys on the top of my mom's car, and then I got in, and they flew off and get them replaced. And then, and then there were like three teacups at the bottom of my bag. There's actual ceramic teacups because I would like grab my tea to drive to the metro and then come back and then I would go inside and put it in my bag and then see my daughter and be so excited to see her that I would forget to. So they were accumulating actually and I got to work and there were all these ceramic mugs. And so I wrote this column, just, just sort of a lighthearted column about the, the chaos of being a working parent and uh, and, and people you know, thought it was funny, and colleagues would talk about the teacup column. But, but there was a male columnist for a paper who was a media critic, and he made this really snarky comment about Liza Mundy writing about the lint in her work bag. Like it was, just, like it was a stupid topic and a trivial um, 
thing to be writing about. And I remember feeling kind of embarrassed and shamed that I was writing what was apparently about a very trivial, you know, work-life chaos was, was seen, at least by some, as, as not really being worthy of discussion in a newspaper. And I think for a long time, for writers, and particularly for women writers, to, to be writing about what it's like to be a parent or a working parent, there was always this fear that you would be stigmatized, that you would be somehow shamed for what you were writing or that it would seem lesser. And, and so what is so nice about the New America Foundation is really since its founding, there's been a work family program. I mean, right there with the, um, with the national security program, with education, with healthcare, there's been a work family program. I think there's been a recognition that these issues matter, that they are important. And um, now with Anne-Marie Slaughter coming here as the CEO and president, uh, we've, we've restarted and relaunched and revamped the program. We're calling it Breadwinning and Caregiving to reflect the fact that it's not just a female issue, it's men and women. Men and women are breadwinning and caregiving. And in the past couple of years to see real heavyweights like Amory Slaughter and Sheryl Sandberg enter this debate about, um, and, and I think underscore the importance of the fact that trying to have a meaningful and productive work life and to do well and to contribute to the economy and trying to care for your children and your families and your elderly parents in a way that is fair to them and fair to you and fair to us all as human beings, that it actually is a really important issue. And what a, one of the many wonderful things about Bridget's book, I mean, Bridget's book, which I've read cover to cover, is such a, um, a masterpiece of reporting. So to see Bridget take, I guess I was thinking after I heard you talk yesterday that, about that column, and I, I was trying to articulate this time crunch that has now become so exacerbated by the fact that we do have technology now, we're on all the time, the economy has changed, we're being asked, like those days when we were getting started in journalism, we little did we know that they were the good old days, right? They were the days when you actually had more time to report and you, and you couldn't necessarily have to answer your smartphone at 3 o'clock in the morning. So. Um, there, there's been these changes, but that you've uncovered this whole body of social science, that there are all these time use researchers all over the world that are validating this topic and studying it and recording the impact on our brains, on our families, on our lives of trying to manage these different realms. So to see um, this great work and these, these voices now coming at this topic in a way that I feel like I've really never seen happen before is just so, um, so exciting and, and impressive. I mean, uh, to see you marshal this body of research, go out and report in workplaces and people's lives and weave your first person um, experience is just, uh, it's just, um, um, just a, a wonderful, wonderful achievement, and I feel like I'm just proud to know you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, really I'm sorry, again, that was a lengthy preamble, but very heartfelt. And so, I just wanted to start with a question for Bridget. Now, I'm just, I really am just going to ask questions. Um, <laughs> one of the great scenes in your book is when you uh, meet with Pat Buchanan, who um, practically single handedly uh, foreclosed the chance of having great widespread government childcare in the early 1970s, when there was actually a moment when we could have had government-sponsored childcare when the president was on board with it and, um, and, and the nation seemed to be on board with it and Pat Buchanan was not and talked the president out of it. And so you go and you visit him in his home and you ask him why, why did you do that? And he starts talking about his childhood when he could come home from work, and come home from school and his mom was a stay-at-home mom and that was great and he could just kind of play as a child and he could just, you know, he doesn't want children in these Soviet childcare, you know, and that was a big part of it and big part of it was keeping women at home, but it was also his view that children should just have this unstructured time and they should be in childcare. And I was thinking about, you know, reading your chapter on play and reading the case that you make for leisure. You say in a way something along the same lines, that we do need that unstructured time in our lives and we do need, children need time to play because children play, can play as, adult, as children can play as adults. So like what's the difference between his argument and your argument? 
you know? Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question. And I just want to say, first of all, thank you to New America for ha hosting this event. And thank you to Liza. I'm a huge fan. And Whatever. we go. Long winded in. No, it was awesome. And you were my editor at City Paper, City Paper. after State's News Service. So we've, we, <laughs> we've gone back long, long ways. Um, and her, your book is amazing. Um, so it is a great question. And I have a chapter in there. I call it A Tale of Two Paths. And it looks at. I want to say U.S. family policy, except we don't have any. So, uh, so sort of it's, it's a look at why, why we don't have U.S. family policy. Why, when you look at these international comparisons, the United States is at the bottom of the barrel on paid leave, on vacation days, on sick days. Um, you know, why do we, you know, the richest and, you know, country in the world, wh why are we here uh, when we have so many uh, working families? We have... Uh, a majority of mothers who work full time, uh, you know, a ma lots of majority of mothers who work, um, you know, in the marketplace, uh, you know, so, so it's not like, and this is not anything new, it's been like this for a while, so why do we not have these family supports? Why do we not have child care? You know, in France, you have child care workers um, who are trained and highly educated, and they belong to the same union, the same teachers union at the, as the university professors in the Sorbonne. And here in the United States, our child care workers are not trained necessarily. It depends on the states. There are really no good regulations or standards. We have none on the, on the federal level except for, you know, uh, uh, people who get vouchers. Uh, and they're just beginning to revamp those for, for the first time in decades. Um, uh, you know, why is it that, that our child care is so hard to find and so, uh, so expensive and our child care workers are paid the same as parking lot attendants and bellhops? And I wanted to understand why, how is it that we got here? Uh, and so, um, so for that chapter, I profiled Pat Buchanan and also Pat Schroeder. And what struck me about both of them is they were really coming at, uh, they were coming at this issue from two opposite ends of the political spectrum, from the right and from the left. But at their heart, what they both wanted was the same thing. And it's that same thing that you just asked about, Liza. And it was this sense of sacred time for family, the sense of uh, uh, a, a time out of time for yourself, for your family, for your life, for, for children to have unstructured time, to not be overscheduled and shuttled every which way, which now we do because people aren't at home. Uh, and what I thought was so interesting is that in Pat Buchanan and from the right, he wanted to preserve that sacred time by kind of preserving in amber this breadwinner homemaker model of having the dad go out to work and the mom stay home. Um, you, you know, so that somebody could be there, he said, at three o'clock in the afternoon for cake and pie. And on the other end of the spectrum, Pat Schroeder had a very different view. She said, I want both mothers and fathers to feel that they can work you know, I want, uh, I want families to make their own choices um, based on whatever it is that they can afford, whatever it is they value. And if you both want to be in the workplace or you feel that that is economically what you have to do, how can we structure the workplace in a way that would allow parents some of the time, part of the time, all of the time, to also have some kind of presence, to be there at 3 o'clock for cake and pie? They both wanted the same thing. And I think that the fact that our workplaces. Uh, I think that was one of the things that struck me the most in our in, in a lot of the reporting that I did. You know, I started off on a journey looking for leisure and very quickly saw how you cannot look at leisure time without looking at work. And you can't look at work without looking at our relationships at home, how they're all very interconnected. Uh, and that so much of this feeling of overwhelm, so much of this feeling of being stuck really is centered at the workplace and that our workplace laws and policies haven't changed. Uh, you know, we're still working under the Fair Labor Stan Standards Act of 1938, which set the 40-hour work week, which, by the way, was discovered by Henry Ford when he wanted to figure out how far you could push a manual laborer without making them so sick they would make, you know, stupid mistakes that would cost him a lot of money. So we have some very outdated policies and structures. We also have some very outdated attitudes. I think uh, there's another author, Katrina Alcorn, who I think said it best. She said, you know, we expect people to work as if they didn't have families or lives. And we expect people to have families or lives outside of work as if they didn't have jobs. So we have these two extreme pressures coming at us at the same time. Uh, and so I think what was so exciting was seeing 
that there are workplaces that are changing, that are redesigning what it means to work, redefining it, uh, sort of taking that, I think Phyllis Moen, the sociologist, had such a be beautiful description of it. She called it time cages, you know, the sense that you have to spend a whole lot of time and your nose to the grindstone, first in, last out, never take breaks, eat your lunch at your desk, and the more you're there and pushing, 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 then you're the best worker. And the crazy thing is there's a lot of social surveys that show we think that that's the best worker. Everybody's convinced that that is the best worker, hard work. And there is also lots of emerging social science that shows that is not the best worker. You know, you get your best ideas in your breaks. Your brain is wired to have inspiration when you take your nose off the grindstone. When you are refreshed, you come into work and you have better ideas. You're more efficient. You do your work better. Uh, the other thing that struck me is when I would travel overseas and when I was reporting this book and you'd go to places like, you know, Denmark, I spent some time there for a chapter, and their view is completely different. That they feel if you work overtime and you work these long hours, you're just simply inefficient. There's something wrong with you. Right, so there's, it's stigmatized, working, working long is stigmatized. It's stigmatized, yeah. yeah. So let's ask Melvin why one of the things that Bridget does um, so wonderfully in her book is, is visit workplaces where changes are actually taking place. And I think for me, you know, 18 years into the working parenthood journey, to see that workplaces are changing is really, um, is really, a wonderful thing to see. So could you talk about ClearSpire and how that workplace is set up? And also talk about why, in your view, this is not, not simply a woman's issue. Um, well, I'll start with um, the, first, the second question. Uh, okay. We have approximately 30 lawyers, and more than, at least half, perhaps more than half, are men. And men with families, and some single men. I, I am a single man. Um, the concept of ClearSpire was to develop a law firm whereby people were not spending 18, 24 hours a day uh, being lawyers. Um, I love being a lawyer. I always wanted to be a lawyer. I started my career, my entire legal career has been here in Washington. And uh, for all of that, most of that time, except for my time at ClearSpire and a two-year stint as a solo, I was in what is called big law, which is the we all know what that is in Washington, the big law firms downtown that have hundreds of lawyers who spend uh, the vast majority of their day uh, working on legal matters. And uh, I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> I enjoyed it as a young man, spending that, that time and doing, I actually enjoy doing the work of being a lawyer and producing the, the papers and going to court and all of those things. Um, but um, at the end of the day, if, if it were to end, you find yourself <laughs> <laughs> oftentimes, um, frankly, burned out. Um, and you, you begin to, to wonder whether it's really necessary um, to work in that manner. Sometimes it is. Sometimes a client comes to you um, with an important issue that requires you to stop what you're doing and to focus completely on that issue for however much time it takes to get the result. And because we are a service industry, that is what we do. But uh, after a while, you begin to wonder whether it's necessary to do that even when it's not a client essential. Um, and, and in the legal profession, what has happened over the past 40, 50 years is that the business of law uh, has arisen and it in some ways uh, overshadows the profession of being a lawyer. And the business of law <coughs> is um, making money. And this is America. There's absolutely nothing wrong with making money. Um, but um, when the focus is solely on that, and then we get into the notion of people working um, 25, uh, 2,500 hours a year, which comes to 60, 70 hour work weeks, and weekends, and you, you're not there, you're there to serve the client, but you're also there to produce numbers. Um, and, um, and I think that is where uh, perhaps my beloved profession has gotten off, off, off track in terms of tending to people's lives and making sure that people uh, are able to have a full life. Um, numbers in terms of income, you mean? Well, numbers in terms of income and also numbers in terms of, we, we, we judge ourselves by the amount of hours that and we build, work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
um, more or less. Um, not necessarily, obviously you want to do a great job for a client, but um, um, the fact, the reality is that um, you are evaluated in part, in large part, based on the number of hours that you put on the books, which translates into doc uh, dollars. And so it's created incentives that are, in my view, um, not conducive with people being able to live full and whole lives. Um, and at, somewhere, at some point along the way, I think um, the business of law has trumped the profession of being a lawyer. I'm not quite sure when it happened, um, but I, I truly believe that has been the case. So after approximately 22 years of doing that, um, I was frankly burned out. I was looking for a different way to live. I am single. I don't have a family. And, um, and, um, but I do have an extended family. Exactly. You, you and, may uh, not have children, but you have yeah, a family. I have an extended family. You have family. a life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have a life. Uh, friends, uh, um, my father um, passed away seven years ago after a long illness, and um, the ability to just tend to him during that time was stress-creating because mm -hmm. I was still in, in that setting at the time. And, um, I needed, he lived in Arkansas, so I needed to be physically in Arkansas uh, a large part of the time to help. And so um, coming out of that and coming out of my uh, tenure as president of the bar, I had the uh, honor of serving as president of the District of Columbia Bar, uh, which is um, one of our, the nation's foremost bar associations. And so coming out of that community service and looking at my family situation and looking at my own life, which was clearly stressed and um, frankly burned out. I was looking for a new, way, a new way to continue to do what I love to do to practice law, but to perhaps do it in a different setting. Um, and so Clear, the ClearSpire opportunity arose, and ClearSpire is, um, is a law firm, a full service law firm. It's a small law firm, uh, so it's not um, of the ilk of the firms that are hundreds of thousands of lawyers, and those firms are great, uh, don't get me wrong. I had a great experience in those firms. We're smaller, but we are doing much of the same types of work. We're, we're, we're simply not doing it quite as intensely. Um, we have a uh, two company set up uh, so that the lawyers are able to focus on practicing law and the service company handles many of the aspects of law, not law practice, but of the business of law that the lawyers typically had handled in the law firm. So that in and of itself takes a great burden off the lawyers. We're able to focus on handling the legal work, which is what we love to do. Secondly, we, don't, uh, we have an office downtown at 18th and Pennsylvania, but our attorneys work most days from their home offices. And the reality is that even in my large law firm, I found that what I was doing as email arose and and uh, so forth. All I would do is I'd uh, drive into uh, my office or Metro in, I'd grab some coffee and I'd go into my office and I'd close the door and I'd send emails all day <laughs> and, <t> and <laughs> talk on the phone, even to the person down the hall. So, <laughs> so uh, the, the physical location isn't quite so important as it used to be and that's one of the great advantages of technology. So when I'm in my home office here, it's much the same as as it was when I was in the, the law firm, uh, except that I'm in my home uh, doing it. And, um, and um, so it's created an opportunity for, for our lawyers to not structure their days around rushing downtown, but rather um, it's home-centric. Um, you can start your day at home, and um, if there's a need to be downtown, you come downtown. If there's a need to go to court, you go to court. But you don't show up. We don't keep time, is my mic you know, cooperating? Uh, we don't show up necessarily just to be seen, and we don't do all-nighters just so that um, the people that work on my team, for example, don't need to impress me with the fact that they've done a 24-hour day. Um, we are very uh, quality conscious, and we demand the same results that uh, were demanded of the practice at the large law firm. One example of that was a matter I had out in Chicago back in the spring, uh, which was a, an injunction case. And if, uh, I don't know how many of you are lawyers, hopefully not many, but <laughs> 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 um, 
An injunction is when a client comes to you with an issue that's so important that you need to rush to court as soon as possible to ask the judge to, to stop something from happening. So the client, based in Baltimore, came to us and needed us to file an injunction in Chicago. Um, and uh, we needed to do it within uh, three days. And we did it. I, I sat in my home office the same way I sat in my office downtown and I worked. Uh, I did work pretty much around the clock on that uh, with a colleague out in Chicago in my firm. And we got the work done. But when the work was done, we didn't feel the need to keep working, <laughs> so to speak. So um, what ClearSpire has, has done uh, successfully is to um, allow lawyers to structure their, their lives and their days in a way that allows us the opportunity to focus on being a whole person. Um, instead of rushing the morning rush to the office, um, I rush to do a yoga class <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> And then I, I, that's my going out. And then I come in and, um, and commence my work day at home. And instead of being um, completely burned out in the evenings or having to stay late just because others are staying late, I'm able to be more engaged in uh, the community. I actually know my neighbors now. Uh, my friends uh, see differences and changes in me. I'm more available to my family. And so that's all good and wonderful, and, and it's a great thing. Um, but change is slow, um, particularly in the legal profession, which uh, lawyers are not known for being uh, um, necessarily forward-thinking uh, when it comes to how we work. We're traditionalist. Precedent is, is ruling in the law. So uh, we're glad that we've been able to, so far, pull together a setting that is helpful. Uh, to our attorneys, and uh, we hope that we will be able to continue to grow and to give others the opportunity to, um, to live more fully. Well, that's great. I just need to clap. <laughs> 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 that's so wonderful. Uh, and I have a number of questions that I'll put to you later, including why aren't all of our firms like that at okay. this point, but we'll, we'll hold that for a second. And, um, and, and ask uh, Kath, if I may mm -hmm. call you sure. Kath, to talk about uh, the Pentagon is not the place where one would expect right. innovative work family policies to be instituted. But as Bridget shows in her book, in fact, it has been. And I wonder if you could talk about your experience sure. there and the changes there that began to evolve and why they began to evolve. Sure, let me take a minute first to describe the work environment and the people in that environment because I think it's really helpful. Um, when you look at a place like uh, the Defense Department obviously is, is massive, the organization that Bridget highlights that I was a part of is the Under Secretariat for Policy. And it's, um, you know, about a thousand people. And it's the brains of the operation. It, it's, it's, well, I'm not, I'm not I, going to say that. I know, <laughs> Bridget, Bridget I know. does right. call I it do, that. Right. Um, I it think is. other parts of the Pentagon believe, believe they may have brains. But I will simply say <laughs> that, that it, is, it is the part that engages, if you will, the foreign policy establishment. Mm -hmm. So it engages the National Security Council, the State Department, foreign counterparts. Um, and also develops uh, long-term thinking for the Defense Department itself. So um, most of the people who populate it come from, who are civilian, come from an international relations or foreign and defense policy background. And it's this mix of military officers um, and uh, career civilians and political appointees. And the leadership is political by, by nature of it being part of government. The, the leadership is always political. So we have many fewer than half that are women, but a number of women and growing number. And that number has been growing since the 80s, quite frankly. And so in the period of time, I've actually worked there for a total of 17 years at different points in time. But in the last um, incarnation that I was there as a political appointee, um, which was uh, from February of 09 when we really started trying to make these changes under the leadership of Michelle Flournoy, um, and then I left last July, there were a number of things that we tried to do to make life more sane. So let me add one more comment before I get to that period of time. As I alluded, I, I was in the organization for a long time, and I was there as a career civil servant originally. Um, and much is described uh, in terms of loving, loving the law. People who work there are not, in fact, motivated by money in any way, shape, or form. Sadly, there's not much money in the business. But they're very passionate about what they do. And they, 
they have that same love of the work and um, the ability to make a difference, incredibly motivated workforce that you're talking about, and thus also given to many of the traps of the you know, bottoms and seat culture, the constant availability, um, the desire to please at higher echelons, and that certainly there's the military culture that is a very can-do culture that we live in. But you also have this peculiarity of the political appointees and the career staff and the military and how those interact. And what's important in terms of balance issues for that is that political appointees come in for a period of time and they leave. And their tendency is to surge and then leave. And then they go back to places like I work now in a think tank where they can have a much more leisurely existence. And so the time they spend in government as leaders, first, they're not typically as invested in the institutional culture and health of the organization. And second, they're there to accomplish specific objectives and they will work really hard and then leave. And underneath that, by and large, are these people who've worked there a long time and they've seen this over and over. So when I was a career staff, I remember one boss whose career said to me one night, night, of course, whatever the time was, I don't know, but we were working late on something, who knows what it was, and she said to me, you know, these political appointees, they come in, and then they go, and they go off to their think tanks or their law firms, um, where they're, by that point, partners and, you know, living a more relaxed existence. Um, and here we are. We're still here. We're here every year. So just think about that from the employee perspective. You get a new boss who's hard charging, ready to go, runs you ragged, they're out the door to go relax, and you're still there. And the next boss comes in who's ready to run you ragged. That's the life that these people live, essentially, day in, day out, and have lived for decades and decades. So changing that culture is more than just changing the mentality of the people who are there all the time. It's about the class of political appointees who come into our government and helping them to think about organizational health as one of their mandates, not just achieving the particular goals, um, the political goals, if you will, that they're, that they're there to achieve, which is uh, important as well. So one of the most important things that Michelle Flournoy did when she came in and throughout her tenure by far was leading by example. And so there are some policies I'll talk about, but I think this is incredibly important. First, and, and most groundbreaking, which I'm not even sure came up in the book, is she took a two-week annual vacation doesn't sound that interesting. That never happened. The, the wow. ramifications of that, people, everyone suddenly realized, you mean I can go away for two weeks in the summer? And you could just see it happen. You know, pe suddenly people, they wouldn't say they were doing it. They would just sort of, you, they'd send in, you have to send in a formal memo at the higher levels and indicate that you'll be out of the Washington National Capital Area. And suddenly it went from sort of two days at a time to a lot more people taking a two-week vacation. Something as simple as that, which was done without any notice, if you will, uh, no, no big rigmarole around it, but completely changed that culture. And I hope we'll stay in it. I certainly took advantage of that. I never took two-week vacations ever when I worked in the Pentagon before. And you better believe as soon as my boss did it, I did it. So just something as simple as that. Um, certainly, the most important thing that we did was institute the alternative work schedule. And that was something that had been done in some pieces of the organization at lower levels. And what the undersecretary did when she came in was made it a policy for the whole organization. First, she test ran it in a couple of offices to prove that it could work, because you did have people who had lived a long time under this other culture of you know, constant availability. Um, and, and, you know, sort of the, the unspoken um, illegal aspect is you got 60 to 80 hours a week of work out of your employees, so why would you actually let them go for less than that when you could not pay them and compensate them at these higher levels and get all the work out of them? So it was, that's a hard culture to overcome because suddenly people are just giving up, if you will, a whole day of work, extra work, if you will, that they were getting from people over and above 40 hours a week. So instituting that um, was very important to show, first of all, that you, you could have a culture where backups were normal, that every a staff member could have somebody who backed them up, that no one was irreplaceable, and no one was irreplaceable, and that you know, you could, people could step in and do the best they could. And by the way, the whole furlough situation that we encountered 
Last summer was another area in which we didn't want to have to do it, but it was a place where we could demonstrate some of these sorts of effects, where we weren't going to have workers there. Maybe it was the, the, let's just say, Egypt desk officer, if we're talking last summer, or the Syria desk officer wasn't going to be there. So you had to create systems within offices that had backups and other things of that sort. Um, so those are, I mean, there were a variety of different ways we tried to do things. Creating predictability was a huge piece of it. Um, again, leading by example by the leadership, and, um, doing things like vacations, doing things like not staying or keeping their people late. These were all sort of cult small cultural ways to shift um, the, the whole organization, recognizing that so much of what we did was completely outside our control in terms of world events, uh, the White House, senior leadership in other parts of the government, Congress. Um, but what you could control, we tried very hard to, to control. That's, that's fascinating. I've I, I got to <laughs> clap on that one. Yeah. That's, just, that's, so, that's so awesome. <laughs> so as you all both were talking about how much you love your work, and I was thinking again about our experience, and I think it's fair to say that reporters also love their work. And it, it struck me that a commonality in these professions is you do have really motivated people who love what they're doing, who will stay, and then it just becomes exponential, right? And so um, people will stay longer and longer. And, and, and I'm thinking, Bridget, you talk in your book about how Henry Ford, you know, realized, looking at, um, assembly lines, at manufacturing assembly lines, reporters who don't, I mean, workers who don't necessarily have that control or, or maybe not that passion, um, that he realized, okay, 40 hours is all that a worker can do before they become inefficient or they start making mistakes and then it affects my bottom line. With a knowledge economy type workforce of people who love their job, how do you put those, I know you all have described them, but how do you, what are the other controls you can put to make sure that people who love their work go home, right. you know? <laughs> right, and don't burn out. And don't, don't create this environment where everybody is sort of moving as a, as a group to just keep working Try all the just, time. Yeah, just keep going and going. Well, you know, um, how long can a knowledge worker work without burning out? How long can they stay fresh and uh, creative and engaged? And the answer is we don't really know. We don't really know how long that is. Um, there have been some studies done that, that it's probably maybe five or six hours. And then after that, your brain just kind of like, you're done, you know, because these are, these are not manual labor jobs. You are not working on a factory assembly line. You know, so it's much, um, you know, it's much more difficult to kind of stay on task and, and to have the kind of, creativity or innovations or thoughts or you know thinking clearly about policy you know it's difficult to you know to demand that for not just eight hours but you know 10 and 12 hours that, that we are working and there's some pretty good evidence that after about five or six hours you're kind of a butt in the chair and what do you do it's like oh I'm really burning I'm gonna answer some emails Blah. you know um, and yet you stay because everybody else is staying and because you have it doesn't mean you love your work any less, but we've created these cultures where we reward those long hours that actually don't necessarily get you the best work. I remember as a reporter, you know, when people would discuss having nanny cams on their kids, you know, to see with their kids. I remember having a conversation with my colleagues. When you think about sort of inefficiency during the workplace, we, we actually said one time, what if our kids could see how we're just sort of butsing around, basically. What if they could see how inefficient we're being at our work? They'd be so horrified. To well, it's so funny. There was an editor at the, uh, well, it's at the Post. I should probably say at a place that shall name, <laughs> remain nameless. But, uh, you know, the, there was an editor who told me a story of a top editor who used to come out at the Washington Post and, and would brag and say, you know, I can tell who the best reporters are by the ones who are still here late at night. And this editor tells me of looking over and seeing like three or four people playing solitaire. Right. You know? Right, right. And it's right. like because right. we're putting on a right. show because right. we think that's what we're supposed to do. But they're not doing great work. And there might be somebody who isn't in the office who's out reporting some great story, which frankly is my view. If you're a reporter, that's where you got to be, yeah. not in the not office. In yeah. And so sometimes I think we forget what is the mission of our work. 
we've kind of gotten so caught up in uh, you know, trying to keep up with the Joneses of overwork, and I will. I I did work on a. You know, sometimes it does require that intense work. It just does. Right. There are going to be those periods of intensity and pullback, but it's like we never pull back. And I do remember not long ago working on a, one of those crazy breaking deadline stories, and you just had to go all in, and there was a deadline, and you had to get this big story in by the Sunday paper. And I, I had Saturday duty, and I, I literally had worked around the clock, and I was so cranky. And I came in on my Saturday duty, and I said something like, oh, I was up all night. And I was, I was angry about it, because now that I've gone through this journey on this book, I value my leisure time, and I realize how stupid I get if I work too long. And I can't, I think, you know, a couple of reporters there, it's like, well, you think you worked? I stayed up two nights. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, but ha so how do you ever <laughs> tamp that down and keep it from become, you know, just accelerating, it, like, space? Well, I think, I, I think uh, both Kath and Melvin yeah. have the keys. And uh, Kath, you said it first, leadership. You have to lead from the top because everybody is going to imitate what the top person does because that's how they see you get to the top. And the other thing is creating systems and structures from the start that are not just, generally what we have that, you know, flexible work uh, throughout, you know, the last couple decades have all been kind of about, all about mommies. And we have flex track and mommy track and well, it's okay if they do it. And they're sort of seen as a nice to have and a one-off. And then we, you know, there's a lot of science that shows, social science that shows that well, then we punish that mother because she's not really being the kind of worker that we think that she should be. And, you know, even when that mother, and I can attest to that, is working those crazy hours because lots of mothers do. So when you create a culture that values, this is how we define the work. This is when we know, you know, when is it enough? you know when is it good enough how do you know when you're done and it's almost like you have to institutionalize that and there are workplaces which is why you guys work in such you know it's really exciting that i found that and there are others that really think through that and a lot of times managers it's harder to define what your work is and harder to like figure out how to bound it because it's a lot easier to manage by time you know check the box you're here yeah now, let me ask you about the changes in, in the law having to do with these flex, you know, flex tracks and alternative tracks. I remember talking to people in the legal profession just anecdotally at a time when law firms were creating um, non-partner track or various kinds of um, ways to work at a big firm where you wouldn't be consumed by your hours. And it was generally seen, I think at one point, is that those were, be, were being created for mothers, that you were going to lose significantly in terms of your pay, you maybe weren't going to make partner. So kind of beware of those tracks because there was going to be a cost in terms of your standing at the firm. It, is that the case in the law? How have you avoided that at Clearspire? How have you assured that whatever flexible tracks that exist are taken by men and women alike? Well, uh, the law in general, I think, has done a, a good job of uh, adjusting <coughs> to that. And, and for one reason, the majority of lawyers today are women. Yeah. The majority of lawyers coming out of law right. school are women. When I finished the University of Virginia in 1987, 40% uh, of my class was women. Now I think the number is probably higher than 60%. Yeah. So that in and of itself has made a, difference. <coughs> has made a big, a huge difference. And uh, you are seeing more and more men who, who want to have family time, who want to spend time with the newborn child. And so it's, uh, it's happening slowly but surely. I think that the uh, financial downturn, which hit the law profession mm -hmm. really hard, right. may have impacted it negatively, but I don't see it ever going back to the way it was. Um, I thought you were going to say maybe that the downturn had forced some innovation, right? Because there have been really significant changes in, in the legal field. There have been significant changes, but the financial pressures un unfortunately yeah. have, yeah. and the focus on profitability, profits per partner, um, and the uh, lessening of the amount of legal work have conspired to create a culture where there's a lot more focus now than there had been, if, if it's possible. <laughs> There's a lot more focus now than there had been on making the money and having your numbers look good. But um, hopefully that's a temporary phenomenon. phenomenon. So at Clearspire, basically men and women are pretty much working the same kinds of schedule. We're all on the same track. Yeah. Um, the people on my team, um, um, many of them are, are, are mothers who have young children. and. 
uh, we just make it work. Mm -hmm. um, if um, we schedule, I don't demand that anyone appear when I want them to appear. We, we coordinate schedules to make sure that uh, everyone's available, assuming that uh, we can do that. You know, sometimes uh, the matter is, dr is driving a schedule and we, we make it work. Um, I don't, um, when, when one of my colleagues says, I can't talk to you at that time because I have mommy duty picking the kids, I say, fine, well, call me at X mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So we just, it's in our culture. It's a part of who we are. And uh, it's not just uh, for family issues. For me, it may be that I, I want to go running in the park <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, or go to a community meeting. We ju it's just a part of who we are at ClearSpire. But even beyond us, I think, that, as I mentioned, the greater legal profession is slowly but surely changing, in large part because of the larger number of women. Right, right. Uh, I'm Facebook friends with a couple of young lawyers who are at big firms here, and they do still seem to be drowning. So yeah. I, I, that, yes. uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that it's changing, but I, 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 I would think that you would have people hammering on your door. Well, me. what has to happen, I think, in, in the big firms is that um, the emphasis on the profits per partner. There's this mentality that the firms compete against each other on profitability because the American lawyer ranks them by how much they make per partner, or the profits that the partners make. And in order to keep that number up, you have to do a whole lot of work. And uh, there isn't as much work as there used to be. So that in and of itself is creating a lot of pressure mm -hmm. and causing people mm -hmm. to, to work. Right, you know. right, right. <laughs> um, uh, and so, Kath, I have a question about um, sort of how you sustain the sorts of changes that you described that are taking place at the Pentagon, some of whom were, some of the changes were a uh, direct result of Michelle Fornor's example, just setting an example of leadership and the importance of leadership. But then there's a problem when that leader is no longer there. I would think it would be possible to go back to sort of the way things were. And the fact is, Michelle Flournoy is no longer there. Right. And you're no longer there. Right. And so, you know, in a culture like that, with people who are passionate, with crises that are happening all the time, um, how, I mean, did the changes really work? Uh, or, or, in fact, I mean, given the fact that neither of you is there anymore, did it? I, I, I think you're quoted in Bridges' book saying, well, it made it a little easier to work 60 or 80 hours because you had a little more control over where you were when you were working. But, you know, is it, is it, do we still have a long way to go if people are still working 60 or 80 hours? Yes, yeah, so I, think, I think it's, you know, we are probably a very hard case at the Pentagon, if you will, in terms of, the, again, as I said before, the ability to control much of what you need to control to make the workplace truly flexible, we don't have that. So because because it's driven by, you can't control what the organization is tasked to do, if you will, in terms of its relationship to the White House leadership, in terms of its relationship to a particular Secretary of Defense, all of that. There, and then, oh, and then there's world events, which right. don't yeah. tend to um, follow our desired uh, you know, my son's high school baseball schedule, right. unfortunately, does not often line up with world events. Um, so given all of that, because I don't want to make it sound Pollyanna-ish, it didn't, it's, it's, all of that is still true. Within that, though, there are changes that I think are sustained. Prior to Michelle coming in, there had been movement toward changes that we were able to carry through. And, and part of that is because um, that career level leadership is so vital mm -hmm. to carrying it forward. And if they set um, changes to the way work is done, often political appointees, again, if you will, the bright side of many not really caring about the institutional health is if there's a process already underway and it's performing quite nicely and they're getting the quality of work um, that they expect and the timely responsiveness, they don't question it. So. Job shares are an example of something that was underway um, uh, before we came in in this administration that we continued and, and continued to grow. Um, the ability for people to um, compete for internal uh, um, positions that open up, to compete only internally for that so they could shift portfolios be is very important for trying to moderate that sine wave a little bit. 
so for instance, if you were on a particularly difficult account, I'll use Afghanistan, very difficult office, can't control anything, um, the hours are awful, people want to do it to support the troops, to support the war effort, but two years in an office like that is more than enough that someone can take. So the ability to um, have other offices um, list their positions and for you to compete for that is a part of how we try to ameliorate it over time. Um, so lots of little things like that that I do think will take hold. But to Bridget's point, leadership is vital. So the other piece is trying to take what we learned as political appointees, and I mean this in a non-political way, if that makes sense, and making sure that that class of people in Washington, you know, frankly, most are in Washington, think about leadership in that holistic way, that it's not just the policy leadership. One of Michelle's, uh, Michelleism is people leadership, policy leadership. You have to have both sides of it. And, and I have no doubt that that can be a bipartisan agenda and go well beyond this administration. Um, so, so that's something I think even from the outside, there are people that, you know, when they go into the building, they come and consult with those of us who've been in the building, and that's part of what we can help change over time. Right, right. So it is a leadership issue, but at the same time, the leaders have to be made aware that this is, right. that this, I mean, if you, if you have a leader, if you have an editor in the newsroom who just doesn't care, then it's very hard, I think, to change that culture as someone who's forced to work for them, right? I mean. Well, and, and that's one of the things that's tough about most of our um, most of our workplaces right now. If you have a measure of flexibility, or if you have some kind of measure of control, a lot of it depends almost directly on your supervisor, your immediate sure. supervisor. And, and it's um, you know because we don't have uh, an understanding or a value of of flexibility, or that work can be bounded and intense and high quality. You know that because we have this value of like work without end. Um, we've really left it very atomized. And so people have very different experiences. And if you do get a measure of flexibility like I did after I had kids, you find that you feel so grateful. And um, you, you, you almost become, I will do anything right. for you. And, right. Um, <laughs> right. You know, and, and you find yourself overworking in different ways. You know, but that's the business case for flexibility, right? I mean, so when you ask, it, is, there a, is there an incentive for bosses and businesses to be flexible and to give leaves and things like that? Well, yes, because you're so grateful and loyal that you'll stay there forever. Right? Well, let me just add, and you attract people. There's, yeah. there's yeah. no doubt we saw that. The more capable leaders in all dimensions to include the way they treated their staff and the way um, they ran their organization, they attracted the best people. As I indicated for us, we cre had created this internal marketplace where people could apply for different jobs. And it absolutely proved out that people would flock to job listings where it was clear that the leadership, even if they couldn't control everything, they were working hard to make life rewarding for right. the employee. And I can sign on for that as well. And perhaps uh, the biggest case I was ever involved in was a three-month three -month jury trial in, in Memphis, Tennessee. And we had 30, 40 lawyers or billions of dollars at stake. The leader of our team decreed that no one should work, um, particularly if you were presenting the next day in court. He said, no, you will not work all night. Mm -hmm. You're going to have dinner, and you're going to go and have a uh, good night's sleep. And then he like said. for a marathon, you have to taper. Yeah, he said that, here's, I don't know if this is true, but I believed it and I think it works. He said, for every hour of sleep that you get before midnight, it counts as four hours. Oh. And so. <laughs> I like that. And I, I actually, I said, okay, well, I'll go to bed at 10 o'clock. So by midnight, that's eight hours. That. <laughs> and so, but I, I really did find myself following that schedule and I found myself in the mornings, much more productive. I got much more done. My presentations in court went really well. And so to this day, I still think very fondly about that, that particular leader. And I'm sorry, the schedule was the day before you basically stop working? You st if you were going to be the person on the hot seat yeah. in court the next yeah. day, you needed to stop working. He was Italian, so he believed in having these fabulous Good dinners, dinner. which was <laughs> great. Car so we'd, loading. We'd, right around now, we'd all be, we'd go to dinner, and then after dinner, he, um, it's like, that's it, no, no more work for the evening. 
because he knows that we would be inclined, particularly if we're going mm -hmm. to stand up in mm -hmm. court before the jury stay the next day, mm -hmm. yeah. stay up all night, mm -hmm. and then stand up before the jury and make uh, a fool of ourselves. So, right. <laughs> but right. I realized though that he was correct that getting a good night's rest made me much stronger in the mornings. I got, my work w went so much better. You, you, you know, you raised such a great point. There's another, um, another workplace that I highlight. And what was so interesting is I saw all sorts of, I called them bright spots in the book, of workplaces doing different things. And they're all doing different things because it matters what your industry is and what your culture is and what you value and the type of work that you do. But it was really cool seeing how, how different and innovative people could be based on what they needed. And there was this one software company that I visited in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And the guy who founded it, it's called Menlo Innovations, uh, Rich Sheridan. He had been this corporate warrior, worked long and hard for years and years. And he, he drew this graph for me and he said, this was my uh, success in corporate America. More and more prestige, more money, higher and higher positions. And this was my happiness. Uh, he was burned out. He was miserable. He never saw his children. And uh, he uh, finally, when he kind of his job evaporated in, in one of the several dot com bubbles, he was so burned out he wanted to start a canoe company, like up in the at Boundary Waters, like <laughs> just get me out. And he decided that he wanted to start a company based on joy. And what joy required then was doing really meaningful, high quality work, but also recognizing that we're human and that we're not just our work. And so they created a culture where they do expect people to come into the office. So it's not like they have telework. It's, uh, it's a very collaborative kind of environment, but they have very bounded hours. And when I was there, five, six o'clock, everybody's gone. And you are dinged if you check your email. They do not want you checking your email or your cell phones, not over the weekend. There was one woman who came there from, you know, from that high-tech industry, and she said, I started working here like you're expected to work elsewhere. I worked 70-hour weeks. I was burning myself out. And, and after one week, the partners came to me and they said, if you cannot figure out how to do your work in 40 hours and go home, we will fire you. So, you know, they're doing very well. They're very <laughs> innovative. You know, so it takes, you know, there are those possibilities that are very hopeful. They're doing great work. They're just not overworking. Mm -hmm. So let me go ahead and open it up to questions now because I think there will be questions. I have a few more if there's a lull, but, um, but let me, uh, are, are you going to call on people? Okay. Uh, you can go ahead. I'll read the mic. Okay. Um, the, waving your hand. Waving. Wave. Because he was first. He was actually first. Hi, Robert Shreda. I'm president of International Investor. I think I'm older than a lot of people in this room. And, and uh, let me just reflect on uh, the fact that I, th I think there has been a societal shift that's causing some of this. Um, I worked in Wall Street, long, t long career. I had a, my first boss there had a great grandfather clock in his office. And when that thing struck a 12, he didn't care if the world was on fire. He went to lunch. When, the wall, when we had our crisis times in Wall Street, he was one of the cooler heads and made the right decisions. So I think there is something to say about uh, not overworking and, and making some time for yourself. But I also think that probably few people in this room have ever heard a union whistle. When I grew up, there was a, a union whistle that went off at five. And I gotta tell you, the people there, the society wasn't perfect, but the people who worked hard in those companies went home and they either grabbed their wife or grabbed their children or grabbed a beer. But I've been here 20 years in Washington, D.C., and I've never seen happier faces than the faces that I saw in those days. Mm. Actually, I grew up in a railroad town, and there was a noon whistle I, I, that you could hear all over, all over the city. i um, forgotten about that. Okay, uh, right there uh, on the side. Thank you so much for this informative discussion. I'm gonna bring up the M word, millennials, uh, and ask if you noticed any generational differences in your book. Uh, I work for a big corporation and they did something really funny uh, where they instituted uh, scooters to people, you know, to go get around the office. Uh, but, you know, I work for, you know, on a small team with a woman who, uh, makes comments because I like to take my laptop and work where there's a window. So uh, what, how do you see the workplace changing because of the differing attitudes of young people? 
I'll, I'll talk about that briefly, and then I'd love to turn it over to you guys and what you're seeing. But I absolutely saw a difference in millennials, and I actually think that that's really hopeful. You know, I know that uh, there's been a sort of a bad rap. Oh, they want to work their own way, and they're entitled. They were these spoiled kids, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, they are proving that you can do really good work. And, you know, that work is not someplace you go. It's something that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's really powerful. And there are also lots of smart young people who are not buying into this kind of overwork culture. Yeah, and the more you get talented people saying, uh-uh, I don't want to do that, you know, business is going to listen because they want the talent. Um, you know, and I talked to plenty of young people. It's just like, well, I got in at 11 because I'm training for a half marathon. But, you know, I worked late last night because I had a great inspiration. And they kind of like stretch and shrink their own hours. But it's like life has more of a value. And there's, there's surveys that show this, and I certainly picked it up in my reporting, that they want good work, but they also want life in a way that maybe people in my generation felt like we had to go all in. We absolutely have seen that in the legal profession. Uh, I served as hiring partner when I was in the large law firm, and when the younger, uh, I presume, millennial age people would come through, the questions they would ask would go directly to this notion of, will I be required to maintain certain hours? Would I be able to work mo remotely or mobily? Working on the go is very important to the millennial crew. And uh, at ClearSpire, we, we're sort of built for that. And so we, we receive a huge number of in inquiries from uh, people in that age group. So yes, we definitely see that. Yeah, I would agree. And I think the most helpful piece of that is that it's both genders. That what the millennial generation really has helped with is it's completely generational. It's not, it's, it, most of them don't have children yet. They, it's, it is for the half, you know, for the marathon or the half marathon that they want the time. It's for their passions that they want the time. And it's not tracked into this parenthood specific issue. Um, it's about how they want to live their lives. So that's very helpful. There are a lot of aspects to, um, let me just say, to having millennials, particularly in a multi-generational workplace that go beyond that. But for this issue, I would say it's very helpful. Right there? Yes. Uh -huh. Hi, I'm Susan Blazin, and thank you very much. Oh, OK, thank you very much. Can you, is it on? Oh, yeah. OK, so, um, so it, uh, this is something I, um, as m most of us here, probably have struggled with for many years, finding our balances and juggling it all. And um, I've, I came to the conclusion early on, but I'm feeling that now's maybe the, uh, there's some open space to move forward with the concept of actually reducing the number of hours we work, not just from 80 or 60 to 40, but even less than 40. And so that we do have time for our bodies, ourselves, our communities, our families. And um, so I'm working on one project evaluating that, the, what we call short-time compensation, which they use in Europe a lot, so that um, kind of like the furlough concept, if in, rather than laying people off, you can reduce, let's say you reduce to 80% time and you get some unemployment insurance to make up the, the uh, difference. But the other project I really want to develop, and I'm interested in asking you all what you think and how, if you've thought about things like this, and asking other people, if you're interested, to be in touch with me afterwards, um, which is hiring people at reduced hours. I mean, I think there's a, a, a leverage spot right now globally. I think we have to really change what our concept of, of people working, every country. It's not just America has this issue of unemployment. And I think there's a place that this, the economic crisis cannot just make people trying to like hold on to our old paradigm, but to really shift it and say, okay, if we all worked a little less and shared the work that there is, then um, we'd have a lot, you know, a better world for all of us. So anyway, that's what my, vision is, and I'm interested in your you know, thoughts on it and everybody else's afterwards. Well, and, but Bridget, you talk in your book, I mean, uh, uh, you look at lower income workers as well, and, and one of the um, real stresses for, for those workers is working a number of part-time jobs and, and feeling overwhelmed and trying to get to each one, and I don't know, so what do you, what do you think about the hiring people at part-time, basically? Well, you know, you bring up really two issues, and that is, 
you know, the Fair Labor Standards Act that I mentioned before, uh, passed in 1938, that protected hourly workers from overtime, but not salaried workers. So what we've got now in, in the 1930s, um, you know, if you worked your 40 hours as an hourly worker, any time over that you got time and a half. It was, a, it was supposed to be an incentive to keep you from overwork. Um, and so what do we have now? Uh, we have far more salaried workers than we did back in 1938. And by law, I, I think I said it in the crudest sense, we can work people to death perfectly legally. Um, it, there are no protections for salaried workers, so that's certainly something to look at. The other thing is uh, part-time work in the United States is terrible. Uh, in other countries, there are, there's parity, there's benefits. It's actually, it's, you're still on kind of partnership and promotion tracks. In the United States, it's terrible. There are no benefits generally. Uh, there have been studies done where they compare uh, people doing the same job at the same level, but if you work full and part-time hours, there's a big wage gap. So there are a host of things that we can look at from a policy perspective. Um, whether it's shorter hours or making, uh, you know, making those adjustments that would, you know, share that work or 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 value people's time. Do other people want to weigh in on the? Well, I would just say, uh, you know, I was a part-time worker for a period of time in the Pentagon, so it is possible even there. And ha it ha again, that trend had been going on since the '80s. And were you stigmatized at all for being? Um, a no, I wasn't. I think you know, in any workplace where you're part, one of the few or only part-time people, you're always very conscious of, probably more conscious, frankly, of how you spend your time. There is no in inefficiency any longer. You don't go to lunch. You don't. You just work. As a matter of fact, one of my searing memories of that is I didn't have a parking, the parking pass I had for the Pentagon during one of those periods of time. Um, that kind of parking was filled when I would get there because I worked a nine to seven. Oh. It's got a 10 hour day schedule, three days a week, which is part time in the Pentagon. Right. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I would illegally park every day in a, a space that I was not designated for. And um, I would leave late enough that when I walked out into the sunshine of Washington from the Pentagon, I could see whether or not my car had been towed immediately. and never once got towed. So that was like my memory. It was the talk about overwhelmed. All day it was like, sh drive yourself into the first space you can find, run into work, work all day, come out, thank God it wasn't towed, and live to fight another day. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I do, I do think part-time schedules should be a piece of you know, of what is offered to make life work for people. And then I'll just say the organization I work at now, the Center for Strategic International Studies, we actually have a 35 hour work week, which doesn't quite equate to 35 hours, but it's still gives and you- And that's full time. Full time <laughs> is the 35, right? You are salaried at 35 hours per week and we charge our time up to 35 hours a week. Um, so there are places that do that. Right there. Oh, okay. I know, I'm her behind you, but I'll get to you. Oftentimes, I think uh, the justification for Americans working so hard and so long is that we are number one in the world, whatever that means, um, and that in order for us to keep our number one spot, we have to work harder and longer than our international counterparts. Bridget, have you found any research that could either support or refute that? I am so glad you asked that <laughs> because that's what I thought too. It's like, well, you know, maybe that's just the price that we pay for being Americans, for our have, you know, being our exceptionalism. We're number one in the world. We're so rich, and you know, so you know, maybe there, this really is sort of a sacred cow that you don't want to touch. Well, uh, and I know, I don't know if you guys saw this, uh, the the most recent Cadillac commercial, the that was running through the Olympics. I actually wrote about it. It drove me so crazy. It's like, why, do, you know, we Americans were so great. You know, why do we only have two week vacations? We have so much stuff. We're so great. We work so hard. Um, and the crazy thing is, the OECD has they do these wonderful studies where they look at if you look at um, say. GDP, sure, the United States, we're way up on top. But then you cut that GDP per hour's worked, a measure of productivity. Well, guess what? There are several years that we fall behind France with their 30 days of vacation a year, and they're leaving early to go have coffee in the cafes. So I think to me, that is the biggest, uh, a really strong data point that shows we're spending, you know, yes, we're number one, but we're number one because of so many overwork hours. Do you like being a writer? 
I do. I love being a writer. And that's why sometimes it's hard to stop being a writer. <laughs> yeah, that gets back to our question. Wendy? That's a great question. Yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm Wendy Paris. I'm a fellow here. Um, I'm curious about the idea, if the 40-hour work week was set for manual labor, as you started talking about, no one knows exactly what's appropriate. Um, what do you call the mental workers, intellectual what knowledge, you, knowledge workers? Knowledge workers. Knowledge workers. <laughs> um, I've been working too long. Um, <laughs> I think part of the problem is people want to feel good about themselves, right? So if we have a bar, we can, and especially in this, you know, Calvinist work ethic country, if we have a bar, we know we can hit it. And I know setting my own hours, I'm, I don't really know, you know, what's a good amount and when I can feel that I've done a good job. So do you think there is an idea, or there should be an idea of a different? This is a similar question, but a different appropriate work week for knowledge workers or a way to deal with that maybe more American idea of I need to feel good, I need to know I've hit the mark, you know, of what constitutes a full day? I mean, that's a huge question. How much is enough? How much is, it, how much is enough? When is it good enough? And how do you know? How do you measure that? Um, you know, and, and a lot of the workplaces that I visited, that's really what they wrestled with. And each one came up with different, different answers. But those are sort of the three fundamental questions. Um, and how do you define your work in a way that isn't just ours? I, I think that we're in the middle of trying to figure that out. I think Wendy was looking for a number, so just give her a number. <laughs> <laughs> My permission. <laughs> when to are stop. you done? Okay. Right. We have to. We do. We have to give ourselves permission to stop. Have you all found metrics? Have you found metrics for? It's yeah. so difficult in the law because every matter is different and requires a different amount of focus and and. Many instances, you do get a result, but in litigation, often that result is some months or years down the road. So it'd be hard to measure someone's productivity based on a result necessarily. Um, I can tell you that <coughs> having spent many a night drafting <coughs> briefs overnight, I, that period from like 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., uh, I may as well have been sleeping. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I, to answer your question, I, I don't know the answer. I don't either. I, don't yeah, know. I think it's like anything. There's no magic pill. No. You've got to figure it out. Right. Although you do talk about the pulse, um, so the sort of working for 90 minutes and then knocking off and work. Of course, that could go on forever. Well, I, I did talk to Tony. That's <laughs> good, yeah. This is America after all, right? <laughs> um, but I did. I talked to Tony Schwartz, who um, uh, runs the Energy Project. And his whole view is you don't manage time, you manage your energy. Um, and it's really a fascinating, it's really great. I'd, I'd encourage all of you to go to the website and, and, and look at some of his stuff. But I called him up to interview him about this very question, how much is enough? And, and it, the first thing he said is like, oh, you're working on a book. I bet you're writing your book the same way I wrote my first book. I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, sitting in your chair, chained to your desk for 10 hours a day. I'm like, yeah. And he said, you know, I don't do that anymore. You know, when you think about how our brain works, you know, we have our, we, everything kind of comes and pulses naturally. Um, and so he sort of mimicked, uh, he set up his work schedule to mimic kind of those natural systems. And he said, I don't work any more than 30, 45, or 90 minute in pulses. And, you know, very intensive, very intentional. I'll choose kind of like one thing to concentrate on. That's what I'll do. And then I take a break and change the channel. And then I come back and I'll do that. And he does that for four 90-minute cycles a day. And where he got that from, uh, you remember when uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote about the 10,000 hours, the personal mastery? You had t to put 10,000 hours in. Well, that's part of what drove this. Woo! Crack the, crack the whip and get back to work. you got to put in 10,000 hours to be... Uh, you know, really great at what you're doing. Uh, but really, when you look at the study that was the foundation for that 10,000 hours, it was a look at uh, the top violinists. And what Tony Schwartz said is, you know, it's yes, they put in the 10,000 hours, but the people who were the best, who performed the highest, they also slept the most. They took the most breaks. They practiced the most intensely, and they did it early. And they practiced in no more than 90-minute intervals. So there is a way to do really high-quality, intensive work and rest, and take yeah. pu and pulse, and take breaks. That's, that's helpful. Valerie. So we've got five minutes. So okay. Uh, Hi, Bridget. Congratulations on the success of your book. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Valerie Young. I was an attorney for 11 years, and um, 
through the births of both of my children. Now I'm a public policy analyst, and I like that a whole lot more. I could never wait to leave the office when I was a lawyer, and now I can't bear to stop working, that I'm focusing on women's economic issues. Um, so far, the, the whole discussion has been framed in how, co how to contain work. It seems to me that if we are to successfully contain work, we have to agree that there is something other than work that is worth doing. We seem to be so enthralled to the idea of paid activity, and paid activity is the only thing that we regard as valuable. But of course, if people don't have children or care for sick relatives or dying parents, I mean, a whole chunk of worthwhile human activity wouldn't happen. And if people didn't have children and raise them, there wouldn't be an economy anyway. Or a human so, species. So how do we elevate the notion of care and the notion of human activity it, taking care of each other? I notice that it's like, you know, they start at 5.30, so everyone here is either single or their children is so old that they don't need to go home and do homework and cook dinner with them anymore or people are you know, training for marathons or something. But or a large, a large part problem. of the human race is engaged in yeah. looking after yeah. each other. Yeah. And yeah. Well, I think, our, I think our conversation started with that, actually. I mean, sure. you were talking How do we about bring that up in the equation? Well, you know, just briefly, I mean, look at what Lies is doing here at New America, you know, and, and reframing this as a breadwinner and caregiver program. You know, and, and it's, it has been work and family, but I think, you know, changing the conversation. One of the things that I found most fascinating about time studies Talk about valuing care. That's one, of, that's one of the main reasons we use time studies, is how do you get a handle on how much time and work goes into those unpaid, invisible, and unvalued uh, activities, kind of the traditional women's work. And what's really fascinating is that there are some countries now that are using that as a measure of their GDP. That there is, now they're trying to put some kind of value on it and using time as a way of doing that. I can tell you that um, in, I've been able to develop my meditation practice um, in, the, in the past five, six years and learn more about the, the Eastern way. And in, in the Eastern way, I'm speaking generally, of course, work is considered all that you do. Dharma, I think, is the term. And it's the caring for others. It's the caring for yourself. And it's the, you know, the work that you do for compensation, but it's also the work that you do for society. And so I, I think I don't know how we get to that in our culture, but I think that's w what you're referring to. And I do think of um, these other things as being on the same par a as my actual work. Um, and I, I think that helps me as an individual to be more productive. So. Right there, yeah, in the blue sweater. Yeah, to follow up on the, uh question here. Uh, yeah, my name is Abraham Avidor, formerly of the Foreign Service. Yeah, uh, to how to, to cope with the stresses uh, created in, 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 in a workplace, uh, what uh, would you advise for people to become, in addition to profitable, uh, to become mentally and spiritually rich, to uh, become physically tired, not only mentally tired by the sedentary uh, lifestyle over here, you know, uh, which will help, by the way, to fall asleep. You mentioned that. Uh, what do people can do to cope with, this, with, the, with the problems created in the workforce, not to take them home, to think about it all the time, to worry about problems? You know, they leave the, 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 the workplace, but they come home and they still take the job with them. And although they're not working there, they are worrying about it. What to do is that occupying the mind and in a counterproductive way. Uh, so any, any, any guidance, any suggestions? How do we work behind? Well, you know, um, yeah, how to leave work behind. I, well, I was hoping that you would answer that because you had such wonderful, <laughs> you know, thoughts about mindfulness and meditation. Well, that, that, that is definitely one way uh, to do it, to become more mindful and to uh, be able to focus the mind, or unfocus the mind, really, is what meditation is, to, to, to make the mind a vacuum. Um, I, um, when I look at this country, I, I don't know I, wouldn't, I couldn't tell you how to begin to make that happen on a scale that would be large enough to impact it in the way that you're asking. But I, I personally know that that, that works for me. I, and I think what you're talking about, you know, in the book what I talk about is change on two levels, those larger societal and structural levels. But, you know, that change is going to be 
you know, change is slow. Social change is slow. That might be a generation or two. So what do I do in, sort of in my sphere, in my life, right here and right now? It, you know, and, and what can you know, businesses do? Uh, you know, when I was in Denmark, there was an American working there. And one of the things I loved about that is she worked like an American does, late and stayed late. And, you know, she would get out and all the stores were closed and she'd have to run to the gas station because that was the only place that was open and buy like little packages of crackers, you know, because that was the only thing that was open. Everyone else was home with their families. It was the, that was the value. And uh, she kept getting these bad performance evaluations. And she's like, I, but I worked so hard for you. But the third most important thing that they, va that they judged her on was her work-life balance. And she said, and they said, you have no work-life balance. And that is something that we value as a country and as a company. And so the more that we can talk about these things and institutionalize that as a value, I think that's really important. And then the more that, you know, it's, it's hard to do on your own to make those kinds of changes. Humans are wired to conform, we're wired to be socially cooperative. So, you know, when you're sort of trying to fight those, you know, those battles on your own, what you've got to do is be clear about your own priorities, but then develop a network of support, <coughs> like-minded people. You know, and then you have to kind of create your own society to kind of push against that bulwark. Or you've got to find places like Clearspire or work for people like CAF. You know, you have to look for those places right now. Uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there. It's after 7. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, but to maintain everybody's work-life balance. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I shouldn't go on and on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys so much. That was Enjoyed so it. Great. It was so fascinating.